This is Luke Bartley, and this is the Book World Podcast. This is the very first one of these. Uh, this is the guest lecturer edition. Um, I've been wanting to do this for a while. I think it's very important for a lot of people to hear from experts and find out what they can be doing better with their uh, the the side of their careers. That's the maybe the boring part, the not creative part, but it's the very important part. I know a lot of people have questions about finances and things like taxes and tax planning and even retirement uh, and how to handle your money and how to be a freelancer, whether you're 1099 or whatever, whatever. There's, there's tons of questions. And I know there, these are questions that are hard for us to ask our friends sometimes because it's money and it feels personal. Um, or it's just something we feel like we should have figured out. So we don't want to mention it or mention to anyone that we don't have it figured out. And we look online and try and figure stuff out, and that, that's all there. But sometimes there, you kind of have to hand these things off to someone. You know, there's only so much you should be doing yourself. I think it's really important at some point in your career to find a team. Uh, your team is your accountant, your lawyer, uh, maybe even a bookkeeper that you work with uh, often. Um, these are your tax advisor. These are people that you count on to help you navigate these things. And that's what they're there for. Um, so there's a one of my questions that I'm going to ask all these people is when do we outsource this part of our job? And that's a hard question for them to answer because it's a very personal decision, but they all have their their own various versions of, of solid feedback. But I'm going to be doing this from time to time, uh, talking to experts that you might not expect, unexpected experts. Maybe that's what we'll call it. I don't know. Um, but This first one is with Phil Gordon. Phil is an accountant. He works for a family practice in Sherman Oaks called Gordon & Gordon. Uh, He has been working with me for a long time. He's great for this because he specializes, not specializes, but he's in LA and by proxy, he works with a lot of people in entertainment, which is a very specific type of person. Uh, Entertainment people clearly tend to have a lot more um, similar tax things to deal with. Uh, so Phil works with a lot of people that are freelancers, actors, writers, uh, animators, designers. He's used to this. He understands their lifestyle and and how they can get the, how they can be most, uh, advantageous with their taxes, I guess. Uh, Phil's a great guy. I've known him for about 10 years now. You're really going to enjoy this. Uh, and please reach out to him. The website is gordoncpas.com. He's a great guy. Everyone at the firm is a great people. Uh, so the first guest lecturer uh, on the Bookwork podcast is Phil Gordon. Hi, Phil. Uh, Phil Gordon. I'll, I'm going to do a quick bio. I don't know a whole lot about you, oddly enough. We've worked together for about 10 years now, or maybe longer. Um, but your family, Gordon & Gordon, is a accounting firm in Los Angeles. And yep. am I wrong to say primarily in the entertainment industry or... Yeah, no, I would say that that's, I mean, living in Los Angeles, that's going to be a big part of your business, kind of no matter what. But uh, no, I mean, we have a wide range of clients from, you know, healthcare to professional businesses, uh, really anyone who needs that help, we're there for. You're definitely, uh, I know, I know you've always told me that the financial services uh, or the, the accounting anyway for people in entertainment, it's always unique because uh, most of us are work for hire 1099s. Uh, our yeah, it's unique. And variable, you know, every year is going to be a little different for you. And it's a lot different from the, uh, you know, the accountant working somewhere that's going to have a W-2 every year for the same amount. You know, it's a very unique situation. And there's a lot of gray area. Things that are deductible for you aren't deductible for me. You know, I'm not in that business. So there is a lot of uh, kind of unique parts of this. Yeah. Well, most of the people that are going to listen to this are going to be uh, freelancers. Okay. Um, And, and, uh, to be honest, it's it's always interesting to me how many freelancers uh, always have questions about that. There's always uh, it's not easy, and it's not people just assume you know what you're doing when you decide to be a contract laborer, but that's yeah. rarely true. You kind of just do it, and then usually figure things out. Like I figured things out the hard way when I was <laughs> really young. Like I I didn't take care of a lot of things, um, and didn't handle things. That's why I, one of the reasons eventually I came to you and. Uh, but the part of this is to to give advice, and you were kind of saying before we got on that that it's always unique, and you hate to like just tell people what to do. 
But I, I do think right. there, there, there is a lot of value, and you can explain what that means, but there is a lot of value for people listening to just have sort of, if not what to do, what to look into doing or what to figure out, what to research, like anything that, because I'm the kind of person that's just like, tell me what to do. Tell me what I need to do right. and I'll do it, you know, like, like that. But, but what uh, you're saying that, that, that it, it, everything's unique. Everything's a, it's not, not, not a black and white statement. Yeah. And, you know, for freelancers, it's often a combination of W-2 income and 1099 income and balancing where the deductions hit. The, the biggest question I have from freelancers, uh, especially with AB5, kind of the new rule that makes independent contractor a little less easy to uh, have that classification, um, is, you know, should I be a corporation? You know, and that really winds up being 90% of my clients that come to me in that first year are asking, look, I've been W-2 everywhere. I'm now 1099. The new company that wants to hire me won't hire me 1099. I can only be hired via W-2. Um, what do I do? And that's the first step is really creating the structure that most fits what your future activity is going to be. And you, but you can't, uh, so how do you answer that question? Well, you know, look, I, I'm not in out to kind of churn the fees of just say, no, be a corporation. Then we get to file your tax return for you. And we get to, uh, do your payroll and your bookkeeping it becomes this whole thing. It's really about, you know, what's the purpose of it? Meaning I have, you know, doctor clients who instead of forming a corporation are just a sole proprietorship because they feel that having the insurance covers them the same way a corporate bail would cover them. But uh, for independent contractors, you know, I have a lot of people in your situation who want to begin to brand something um, and make something bigger than just themselves. So if that's the goal, then there's really no uh, limit on how much money you're making before it triggers that event. So is there, is, okay, that, that's good. Is there anywhere you would say, how would you uh, advise people to start investigating how to make that decision? If they're feeling the sure. peace with it, what can they do to say, okay, I have to decide this. What's the roadmap? Yeah. So I, I, I think first is your vendors, meaning if the people who want to pay you will only pay you via W-2 and you're looking at a way to get out of that, because you know from the first part of it, if you're 100% W-2, there are no um, expenses you can take against it. As a matter of fact, a few years ago with Trump's tax changes, he eliminated unreimbursed employee business expenses, which for last year, when all these employees were working from home, that would have been a really big break, but not there anymore. So it's put the, you know, the importance of being an independent contractor to be able to deduct those expenses. So, okay, so that, that's good. So what are the, what are the uh, advantages? What are the, what are the, the, the top, two or three things to consider like some people may not even know may not know they need to even consider this so you're you're saying you're either a w2 employee with taxes taken out or you're a 1099 incorporated individual with no taxes taken out but more advantages at the end of the year yeah i mean look disregard all of the uh, benefits one gets as an employee because obviously that's going to be different everywhere you work but if you get health insurance and you get, you know, all these different things, profit sharing plan, whatever it may be, those things obviously have value, intangible value or tangible value over and above just what money you're making or what tax you're paying. Okay. So put that aside. It's really a function of, are you paying income tax and payroll taxes on hundred percent of your income and not taking any deduction against, or are you being paid via 1099 and now can deduct expenses that wouldn't normally be deductible? And many people think that, well, I need to have, you know, an office to deduct rent and I need to have employees to deduct anything, but it's really everything. It's even just so far as your cell phone and, you know, your computer supplies and you, you know, making some office space around those things in itself can help. Then you get to some of the other pieces like a more aggressive retirement plan or being able to kind of budget the tax you pay. Meaning if you make a ton of money in the first quarter, Instead of paying a ton of tax in the first quarter, if you don't work for the entire rest of the year, your tax can fluctuate. So maybe it's not a good idea to have everything withheld at the time you make it. It's more about planning over the arc of the year. So, and, and also this is a decision that the, the team gets put together here. You'd also say talk to a lawyer, right? If you are thinking about incorporating. Yeah. 
I mean, there are, there are definitely legal issues involved. And, you know, most people come to me thinking I'm going to just answer every question, right. including the legal side of it. Yeah. And as much as I know a lot about that, I still do defer to the attorneys for, you know, the history of the thousand cases they've tried in court that did or didn't win. Right. But from a rules perspective, we usually kind of start with the structure first. And then if things get complicated, like there's a trademark involved or a partner, then yeah, having an attorney kind of look at things is helpful. But then you get into, should I be a, an LLC or a corp yep. um, or a sole proprietorship? And uh, that becomes a function of cost and about whether or not you need to be an employee of your own corporation, which is an entirely different um, uh, kind of headache you know, to have payroll. Right. Okay. So I've got a list of questions here that I'm going to ask everyone that does this. And I think you've looked at it. Is there a, I also like to uh, try to learn as much as I can on my own. Is there a book or manual that you would, you would hand to anyone that freelances, whether they're W2 or 1099? You know, there's no book or manual, at least none that I've seen. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I've wanted to write one because it always seems like I'm writing so many emails explaining every situation that if I just took those and put them in book form, yeah. It would explain everything, would. but I don't think it's that easy. Okay. And, you know, from my perspective, I'm looking at industry um, documents, you know, the journal of accountancy, you know, however nerdy that may seem, those are really giving me the information I need, but none of that is going to be usable to an independent contractor who has been on W2 for years and now is jumping off into that. Okay. Um, you know, unfortunately right now, the best way to kind of get news or updates is just literally searching the internet and finding some guy on YouTube who's going to make a video of it. You kind of get the understanding of it, but then you speak to a professional about how that applies to your specific situation. Is there, is there a search you would recommend, uh, after this is over with typing this in? What, what? Yeah. I mean, freelance via w, or versus W2. Okay. I mean, if that's really what the crux of this conversation is, you know, whether being a 1099 is valuable, then that's really where it's going to hit. But I would say that every freelancer that comes to me is already pocketing all these expenses they know they have. Yeah. And most of them have already talked to somebody who said, you need to do freelance. You know, you need to do this on your own. So, okay. So forget about freelance. Just generally speaking, for people that are trying to manage their own finances, is there a thing that you find most people are doing that you recommend changing or adjusting? Is there, are there any financial habits that you, that are generally problematic for a lot of people? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, you know, look, taxes are complicated, but there's something that everyone's got to deal with and it affects everyone. So I would say, you know, first and foremost is to kind of get an understanding of what your situation looks like. And on the other side, I would say that, you know, trickle down savings is probably the biggest thing that people don't do. Meaning if, uh, if you have 10 grand coming in in a month, you should be automatically putting 3000 of it to a tax savings account that you don't even touch. It's not even your money. You don't even see it. It's not in your account. And then if you have property taxes that you pay every six months, or you have camp for your kids, you know, having some set up savings so that you take that, uh, uh, amount you're going to pay divided by 12. And then every month you're saving to that account, getting things out of your perspective out of your view, I think is a big piece of the puzzle. Um, as I've, I've said before, I'm, we've, we've talked about this is, you know, if you're saving for tax and then at the end of the year, I say, <clears throat> you know, you owe 15 grand and you say, oh, that's wonderful. I saved 17, five. Well, now you have this 2,500 to potentially put in a set, put in a retirement account, or even just pay for the fees that you incurred through all this process. So having good habits from the start, knowing what your situation is, that's going to make it super easy at the end. And you want it to kind of be on autopilot. You know, you don't want to have to constantly think about this. I mean, this is what I do every day, but you don't want to do this every day. You're doing what you're doing every day. Yeah. So can people talk to you about, uh, so SEP is a retirement account that you can, uh, an incorporated uh, sole proprietor can pay into, correct? Is that, are those things you can help with? Or is that also, uh, is, that a, is that another a business affairs person or... No, I mean, we, anything related to tax, we're always here to help. So everything from investment advice to retirement advice to estate planning, all has a function of um, tax that we deal with. So yes, I'll say contribute to a SEP because your tax will come down, right? It's a no brainer. But if you're looking to buy a home in the next year, maybe it's more important to save that money for the down payment 
or to make the underwriting easy. Or maybe your attorney or your investment advisor says, you know what, I'd rather you not do a SEP or do half of the SEP and instead invest in real estate or whatever they think is better for your allocation of your portfolio. I don't want to sound uh, uh, mean, condescending, but I bet most of the people that listen to this probably haven't considered those types of retirement accounts. Do you think everyone should be doing that in some in some sense? Well, you know, look, the, the first thing my first accounting professor ever told me at UCLA was put the two grand in your account every year the day you graduate from college because it's that little bit of savings compounded in a retirement account that has no tax that you're paying on it as it grows. That from when you're 18, when you're 22, whenever you find that you're in a job and you're ready to start saving a little bit, even just a little bit helps. So by the time you're now you know, 40 and you've been working for 15 years or whatever it may be, and you have this accumulated retirement plan now you don't necessarily have to feel that you're behind the eight ball and you now have to contribute more than you would feel comfortable. So, And, and your company, Gordon and Gordon, can help people set up those accounts? We don't set them up and we don't advise what's in them. All I say is that, look, you, you're going to owe 20 grand in tax. Do you want to owe f- 15 grand instead? Then move money from one pocket to the other pocket, save for your retirement and pay less in tax. What you do with that money in that retirement account, that's something somebody else is going to tell you. But you can, because they'll probably say, okay, who do I call? What do I do? You can help. Yeah, at least of course. Them, tell them what to Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the, the good thing about kind of working with so many freelancers in so many different uh, spaces is that, you know, we have really good referrals, good investment advisors, good attorneys, and yeah. good people that we work with that we feel comfortable with. So there's always someone there to help. At what age or stage of someone's career or what should, when, when should someone outsource this and have a, either a regular bookkeeper go through their books or even hire an accountant to do their taxes? Like when do you recommend someone find a professional? Well, you know, I think there's, there's two pieces of that question. One is peace of mind and the other is actually paying less than tax. And I think there are a handful of clients that come to me that if they did their own return on TurboTax, it would probably be the same, right? I mean, technically, there's only one way to file a return, right? The correct way with all the information. Mm-hmm. But peace of mind is just, I want someone else to do it, someone else to file it, so that if there's ever an issue, someone else is going to help me with it. And on the other side, it's the client that you know, is missing expenses because we're not talking about it. Or you know, one of the first things I say is open up a separate bank account. For sure, first thing. That way, you're making the decision on what's a you know, reasonable and necessary business expense by simply what card or what bank account you're pulling out of your wallet. That way, at the end of the year, I'm not deciding what Ralph's run was for you know, craft services and what was for you know, your pet. Right. So you're making that decision. And it creates this gray area that isn't gray anymore because you're actively making the decision about where you're paying things from. Sorry, to be clear, you're saying open a, a different account for what you, what you would call business expenses. Right, or just your freelance activity. Yeah. Okay. And, and your question was about bookkeeping. And I would say that my, my point is, is that if you have everything in this one bank account, then even if you had no bookkeeping the entire year, at the end of the year, you could literally give that bank account to someone and say, you don't even have to make decisions. Just recap it because it's all business. So open up now that's Neil Berkeley personal, Neil Berkeley savings. And then have another account that even even that says it's called Neil Berkeley. Uh, it doesn't have to be under a business. TIN. It can be under my social. You can you can have two bank yeah. accounts. Okay. Yeah. That's, sure. Oh, that's, good. that's good advice. I I'd never heard that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, because because there's a business entity, that decision is being made already. But when somebody is now first starting, having those separate bank accounts is not something people think about often no. because they're like, look, I'll just take the money, deposit it personally. Well, they also wouldn't think they can have two personal bank accounts. Yeah, it's true. So, it's true. That's I'm sure there's people listening to this that that would like to have somewhere else to put their uh, quote business expenses, freelance expenses. Right. Um, what about a credit card? Would you recommend just doing that on on its own credit card? Yeah, same thing. I mean, look, if you're going to form an entity, then all of those accounts need to be in the ID number of the entity, including a credit card and a bank account. Okay. But if it's just you as a freelancer, then yes, I would just say, you know, this Sapphire card is only for business. 
Yeah. I only use it for business. That takes discipline. It does because you also want to rack up the benefit of the card. Yeah. So if you're like searching for miles and you want to put your kid's school on it, well, you're going to put it on the card that gives you the most benefit. Yeah. But it does take discipline to say this coffee is business, yeah. but that coffee was personal. So I think a lot of people, um, finances, making money is fun, getting rich is fun, but personal finances is a headache. How do you change someone's, how do you uh, help someone enjoy this process? Yeah. You know, I think it's organization and feeling that you're not behind the eight ball, right? Because so many clients come to me during tax time and say, I really don't know what things look like. I don't, didn't see my, you know, I have no idea how much money I made. So once you do everything, then tell me what I owe and I'll either freak out or not. (laughs) And, you know, and, and the other side of it, you know, I do my own QuickBooks file, right? Well, my QuickBooks file is like perfect. And it tells me everything I want to know, but there's some middle ground there. And that's where I think having that bank account is the big start. Because you can kind of identify how you're doing that year by how much money you pulled out of that account or how much money increased in that account. And then creating these supplemental savings accounts so you can watch the pieces grow. You know, here goes your uh, kid's school account and then it's gone. And then here comes your property tax and then it's gone. And seeing those different levels of what you have, I think, keeps it interesting. And then I find that clients who are actively trying to uh, get out ahead of tax and know what's a deduction and what isn't, do find a little bit of satisfaction in knowing which credit card they pull out is going to benefit them in a, in a bigger way. And what about, Meaning, uh, Quicken, for people that are uh, not incorporated, would you recommend everyone at least have Quicken and go through it once a week, once a month? Sure. I mean, technically, all we're talking about is taking every single thing that's on a bank statement mm-hmm. and recapping it in some way. So if, if um, uh, Excel works better for somebody or Mint or whatever the system is, I find that it's more important that you work within the system that's best for you than what's best for me. I tell my clients, you can be wrong, just be consistently wrong. Yeah. And if you're consistently wrong, then I know that you putting draw in an expense isn't really an expense. Yeah. But if it's all over the place, I'm never going to be able to follow it. I think I'm using Quicken in a in a global like to it. It's a it's a bucket for Mint and Excel yeah. and all. But you're saying have something like don't have it in your head and don't have it in a bank statement that you don't look at. Have it somewhere that you see every now and then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, look, financial statements aren't for me; they're for the user. You know, the financial statement or the analysis, whatever it may be, is for you. You know, for you to see what you're spending money on and how much money you're making. You know, I could do a tax return on the back of a napkin. But the detail is for you. Okay. Um, so how do people, would you recommend anyone listening give you a call? Of course. Of yeah. course. I mean, if anything, I'm happy to help. Yeah. And one of my biggest, um, uh, the thing that I enjoy most about what I do is helping somebody who doesn't understand is going from being a, uh, an employee to an independent contractor and is really just looking for somebody to explain something in a way that they understand and that they can talk about. So knowing that somebody's going to listen to this and have that same kind of progress going forward, you know, that's what fulfills me in my job. It's not working with the big corporation that just considers me another professional. Right. It's working with somebody who has a real emotional and a real, you know, hard time with this and to be able to help them through. And you know what? It's going to take a cycle or two, sometimes a year or two before it even makes sense or comes into perspective. But when it does and it clicks, there's, there's a lot of satisfaction there. That's great. So how, how do people reach you? Well, I mean, we have a website, gordoncpas.com, or uh, you can always call us. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll put your uh, info on, on the, in the email, Go, uh, gordoncpas.com. Correct. Yeah. Great. Um, Phil, thank you for everything. Thank you for doing this. This is, this is great. Uh, I think there's a million more questions, but this goes out to a lot of people. So hopefully you'll, you'll get some phone calls and some new business out of it. Uh, Sounds good. But uh, thank you very much, Phil. I appreciate it. Good talking to you. Yeah, you too. Good to see you. There he is, Phil Gordon, someone that I highly recommend you reach out to uh, at phil at gordoncpas.com. Uh, you can also go to that URL and get their phone number and call him 
He's a great guy, very smart guy. I'm sure he'll help you out uh, and probably bring a lot of sanity to your life. Um, so if, also, if you have ideas for these, email me, neil at uh, getbook, G-E-T-B-O-O-Q dot com. That URL is going to change soon, by the way. Uh, got some announcements about that. Um, and uh, thanks for checking it out. We will see you next time on the, or we'll talk to you next time. You'll hear us next time on the Bookwork Podcast.